Um, look, I'll say a few words, and maybe Carsten can supplement it, uh, and um, and then perhaps we could have any questions that you want. There is, uh, uh, and there are uh, an awful lot of data in this publication, a huge amount of data. So I'll try to direct you to some of the interesting developments that the data indicate. Um, overall, I would say uh, two very main points, and then a lot of subsidiary points. The two very main points uh, would be, I think, first of all, that despite the continued uncertainty and fragility of the global economy, or uncertainty in outlook and fragility of the global economy, intellectual property performs well. Uh, 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 when evaluated by the number of, you know, uh, uh, applications for intellectual property protection around the world. So in 2011, uh, and this is what the data deals with, patent filings around the world grew by nearly 8%, grew by 7.8%. Uh, trademark filings grew by 13.3%. Industrial design filings grew by 16%, and plant variety applications grew by 7.8%. So overall, you see that it's quite a good performance. Why? Uh, well, Carsten's perhaps better qualified to answer that question than I am, but I would suggest, and Carsten can supplement, that first of all, it, 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 intellectual property concerns one of the best performing parts of the economy. It, it concerns the innovation economy. It concerns um, uh, you know, those parts of the economy where we see uh, the new economy uh, uh, operational. Um, and secondly, these overall figures, of course, reflect uh, a, you know, a steady intensification of globalization because you can break the figures down into resident applications, you know, and non-resident applications. And in general, over the years, we see a rise in the number of non-resident applications, which means, you know, uh, in general, enterprises seek protection across in broader markets. So I'd say these are... Carsten, do you want to add to that explanation for why? Right. Um, I think that uh, is uh, definitely the case. If you look at the growth in patent filings uh, over the last 10 years, uh, we do observe that um, you know, the growth of what we call second filings, which are mostly filings of patent offices in additional offices uh, outside of the applicant's original jurisdictions, uh, you know, we see um, you know, relatively rapid uh, growth in these filings. And I think that reflects, as the Director General said, that applicants have an interest uh, to see their inventions protected uh, in a larger number of countries as they are more likely to engage in international business and are more likely to have operations in a larger number of countries. Uh, so certainly non-resident filings, as we call them at WIPO, are an important driver of um, 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 filings at large. Yeah. And then, okay, so the second development, big development, I'd say, uh, is that China's patent office became the largest in the world in 2011. Uh, so that's quite a significant development, really. Uh, it was, it already had the largest number of trademark filings, and it already had the largest number of industrial design filings. Now, last year, it uh, moved into the position of having the largest number of patent filings. So this is really quite a significant development. Of course, we have been uh, talking uh, about it in our meetings with you for several years now. Uh, but the trend continues and, uh, if anything, only intensifies. So those would be the two big developments that I think are revealed by the report as a whole. Uh, now, if it's helpful, I'd be happy to point you to, you to some of the data that are 
perhaps interesting in respect of patents and uh, trademarks. Uh, I'll be re relatively light on what I give you, but we can always supplement it. So uh, for patents, around 2.14 million patent applications worldwide in 2011. Uh, as a matter of interest, China received 526,000 of those. Uh, the US received, the United States Patent Office received 503,000 of them. And Japan, the third in line, received 342,000 of them. Uh, so that's, that's the top three. Uh, we find that the majority of the top 20 officers experienced a growth in the number of applications, which is reinforcing the first point that I made. Uh, and perhaps the other thing to mention in respect of patents is, you know, we've also spoken in the past about the large number of unprocessed patent applications or the backlog. And for the second year running, this went down by a slight figure. It went down by 4.9%. Um, the preceding year, it went down by 3.3%. So the number of uh, of unprocessed patent applications in the world in 2011, we estimate to be at 4.8 million. But the good thing, good news, is that despite rising numbers, the backlog, if you like, is declining. So some of the policy actions put in place by patent officers around the world are paying off. For trademarks, uh, for trademarks, let me say, uh, 4.2 million trademark applications worldwide. Uh, that was a, rep as I said, 13.3% uh, uh, increase. China accounted for the, for 61% or 62% of growth in trademark applications worldwide, an enormous you know, increase in trade, trademark applications in China, uh, and perhaps just 31% actually uh, increase in, in trademark applications in China, uh, and perhaps to signal that around the world there are some uh, 23 million trademarks in force. And then perhaps rapidly industrial designs, to point out that, um, which grew by 16%, there were 775,000 industrial design applications around the world. One of the interesting things about design protection is, that, is the greater participation of middle income and lower income countries, especially the middle income countries. So of the top 20 officers, nine of them are uh, middle-income countries. So China, again, the largest number of design applications with some 521,000. You see that's an enormous amount of the total number of applications. Uh, but good performances in countries like Turkey, Mexico, India, I can give you India up 16.7%, Mexico up 17.2%, Turkey up 17.6%. Uh, and in plant variety protection, perhaps just to say they grew by, uh, the number of plant variety uh, applications grew by 7.8%, uh, but I think I've already said that. So perhaps I'll stop with the detail and um, we can start the dialogue. Yeah, please, Car Car sorry, Carsten, let me uh, hand over to Carsten. Okay. Mm. Well, maybe let me just uh, make two additional points. Um, the overall growth in patent filings worldwide in 2011, as the Director General mentioned, uh, was 7.8%. If you look at the performance of individual offices, uh, there are, of course, a, um, um, a lot of differences. Uh, and I think if you look at the headline numbers, um, you would find in the report. Uh, it is quite remarkable how well uh, these numbers coincide uh, with um, um, the economic uh, performance in 2011. In particular, uh, we see um, you know, 
very grown, very strong growth uh, from China, 34.6%. 34, 34 uh, that 2000, in the year of two, 2011, when the Chinese economy was still one of the fastest growing economies uh, in the world, uh, we see a um, much slower growth rate in the developed economies. In the United States, uh, we have growth of 2.7%. Uh, um, we do see um, a relatively sharp decline of 5.4% at the European Patent Office. And that, again, at its face value, is quite consistent uh, with uh, um, the economic difficulty through which uh, European economies uh, um, have gone uh, in 2011. Uh, but we also see, um, and I think you know, that is uh, um, remarkable, relatively good performance uh, from other emerging economies, in particular India. We see growth of 6.4% uh, and we see 13.5% growth uh, from um, South Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so in principle, you know, if you look at these results, uh, they make sense in terms of the underlying economic performance in the respective economies. I should caution, though, that while we know that there is a correlation between the business cycle and patent filing behavior, <clears throat> this is not a one-to-one -one correlation. And there are <clears throat> many factors that influence patent filings from, excuse me, from, um, from year to year. For example, um, the decline at the European Patent Office of more than 5% comes uh, after more than 10% growth in 2010. So uh, there are certainly year-to-year -year variation that are not entirely explained uh, by the business uh, cycle. The second brief point I wanted to make that in the area of patents, the growth of patent filings is relatively um, widespread, widespread across technological fields. However, the one technological field that has seen the fastest uh, growth uh, over the last uh, five years is the field of digital communications. And you know, again, this is something that uh, we have known for some time. Um, one could argue that this reflects, on the one hand, the technological opportunities uh, that uh, exist uh, in this field. And I think you know, this is something that uh, we um, observe uh, every day as we use our smartphones. But arguably, it also reflects uh, the fierce competition among innovating firms in this sector and the need uh, for uh, innovating companies uh, to protect uh, their intellectual property um, in, in the marketplace. Um, let me stop. These were two additional observations I wanted to make. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that the report uh, was presented only now, today because the print was late. I mean, it, uh, it, it's, for us, it's not very good. Um, we have to have a short time. Right? And um, I hope it was the print when it was late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if everybody here agrees um, to slam an embargo until tomorrow, does that bother you? Well, except that I think at some point we have instructed our colleagues to publish the document on at the web. At 3 o'clock. At that 3 o'clock, yes. That can be stopped. But if that could be stopped. I mean, Does, do, will everybody play by those rules? No, no, I, no, I don't. I, 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 I know. Yeah. For me, it's, it's OK. okay. No, but, but it's just right. a, No different next time. I'm sorry. Okay, we're sorry about that. And yeah. we'll, we'll make sure we rectify it for next time. Yeah. But it's helpful to get it 48 hours in advance. OK. Not 200 pages of and understood. Okay, we will no. fix it. And the time. ILO report today on uh, agenda. Okay. 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 Fine. Okay. Noted. Hi, I'm Yu Mai Gao from Asashi Media Japan newspaper. I would, I would like to ask one question on China. Uh, if you look at all those books and figures, it looks like a resident uh, application is huge. Yeah. Does that mean the Chinese companies are filing more? Do you mean the multinational company filing more in Chinese soil? Well, it means both, but uh, it means uh, in particular, the first, I think what you can see with these figures coming out of China, whatever else you might say, you must say that uh, there are good evidence that China is embracing the intellectual property system. You know, uh, they are using it to an extraordinary extent. So uh, they now file more patent applications, or more far patent applications are filed in China. Uh, in the Chinese office than anywhere else in the world, 
And of that, the resident applications is very high. Karsten, do you know what the resident application share is? Uh, in it's, the case of China, China, I think it's more than 80%. <laughs> I think it's more than 80%. Yes. Well, 79%. 79%, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And the same applies for industrial designs and the same applies for trademarks. So, in pure <laughs> quantitative terms, it's very good evidence that they have really embraced the intellectual property system and are using it on a widespread basis domestically. You know, in their own enterprises. Stephanie. With all respect, this is, this figure is around 2011, yeah. and China's growth has slowed down in the past year. Do you have any um, anecdotal evidence or any preliminary figures this year, which is just about over? Uh -huh. Do we you indicate the trend has continued, or? Or, on the contrary, it's the, the, the anecdotal evidence that we hear from China is the trend continues. I can't say that that's going to be at the same uh, rate, which was, in for patents, what was it, 35%? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I can't say it's going to be at the same str strength, uh, but uh, continued growth, both in their domestic filings and in their international filings, yeah. in 2012. Mm. John, AP. Um, Jonathan, yeah, I just wondered, why does it take all year to crunch the data on this? Yeah, yeah. Justin? Well, we don't yet have a system where, um, you know, these data are reported to us uh, in an automatic fashion. What we do, we um, run a survey of intellectual property officers uh, worldwide uh, where we send questionnaires, you know, which by now are all electronic questionnaires, uh, to um, global IP, IP officers uh, in, in all the countries. And uh, you know, it does take uh, these uh, officers a uh, considerable amount of time to compile their own data and then send it to us. Uh, and, you know, we have been uh, quite keen to accelerate uh, the data collection process um, um, as much as uh, possible, but, uh, um, you know, this is, this is currently the best we can do. I should note, though, that, you know, we have improved uh, the um, time lag with which uh, these data are reported. Uh, last year, uh, in 2011, we, for the first time, reported data for the previous year. There used to be a two years uh, lag. Um, but I think for now, this is uh, the best uh, we can do, that towards the end of the year, we come out uh, with the national um, filing data from the previous year. Let me, if I may, <coughs> add to that, to say that if we were to report on 20 countries, we could do it in March. But uh, reporting on the number that we do makes it a much more cumbersome procedure because in, an, in quite a large number of developing countries, their statistical capacity and their use of measurement indicators is somewhat limited. So it takes, that's one of the explanations. Mm. Jean-Pierre? Uh, I have a question. Do you have also a kind of an overview of the uh, patent breaches? I mean, it's a, with the in, heavy increase in China, but I mean, they copy less. And, uh, uh, well, we can't draw that conclusion from from mm. the data, out there, yeah. but but what I would say is that they're producing more. Mm. So they're producing more, which would suggest uh, that they have a strong interest in the technological production being protected. But, uh, but do you have a? I mean, your office, you also you know. Worldwide we don't have statistics on infringement worldwide okay. uh, because that's you know that's a question of, of a, a very disparate court system mm. you know in every country yes. and it's very difficult to. The OECD is collecting this data. Why is it like that? The OECD is collecting data on infringements. On infringement. Yeah. yeah. Well, what the OECD has done, they have uh, estimated uh, the share of counterfeit and pirated goods. Uh, yeah, they based them on uh, legal proceedings and filings in Chinese courts, for instance. Okay. Well, I'm unaware of that. <laughs> I haven't seen it. But uh, what I would say is that uh, the Chinese government itself publishes uh, statistics uh, on IP litigation. And the last time I looked at these st st statistics, they certainly see, an, you know, you see an in increase in litigation which is not surprising given that uh, you know you have uh, 
you know, fast growth in the number of IP titles uh, that uh, have been uh, issued. So one would expect uh, more disputes uh, to occur. John, and then Dan, sir. Yes, yes, but they're publicly available. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up on okay. Stephanie's question about what we can find for 2012. Um, would you expect China to continue to be the largest patent office in the world in 2012 from the information you have so far? And how do you differentiate between resident uh, filers and international filings? For example, if you have a joint venture, which is maybe 50-50 owned by a Chinese and foreign company, or even a wholly owned subsidiary based in China, do they come as resident or are they... Yeah, not the resident. Mm. Yeah, no, the, the, on the first one, yes, and on the second one, yes, we would con expect uh, China to continue to maintain its position as the biggest uh, patent filing office. And on the second one, well, it's it's not on the ownership of a country. It's the it's the place of business of the company of the company that determines whether it's a resident or not. Right. I mean, technically, the criteria, criterion we use is uh, the residence of the first named applicant in the patent application. So if you have a subsidiary of a multinational company in, say, China, and that multinational company files locally using that subsidiary, it would be counted as a resident application. Whereas if that company files from its uh, headquarters in another country, it would be counted uh, as um, as a non-resident applicant. Okay, so just to be clear, Philips China, for example, filing would be considered a resident. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yep. So, Yogi, and then uh, John. Well, in questions to your people, you have to ask them to the same process to make them do for the normal applicants if it's important to have them here. C'est de savoir est-ce que aujourd'hui on peut constater malheureusement je parle encore du votre rapport qu'il y a des efforts des améliorations dans les pays africains et dans lesquels ces demandes de brevets et ces reconnaissances sont les plus importants et, et la question qui tout le temps la première c'est de savoir est-ce que ces reconnaissances dépendent du développement des pays en fait bon. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, l'Afrique, euh, pour l'Afrique du Sud, il y a eu une augmentation de 13,5% de nombre de demandes déposées. Donc ça c'est une, euh, euh, une augmentation euh, forte. Euh, pour les chiffres plus généralement pour l'Afrique, euh, je ne les ai pas du nom, pour l'Afrique pour l'Afrique. Non, alors... Euh, on n'a pas beaucoup euh, de statistiques sur euh, le euh, continent africain, mais euh, peut-être euh, je peux dire que euh, euh, ce qui est important euh, dans le cas de l'Afrique est d'examiner les statistiques sur les marques parce qu'on sait que les marques sont un, un type de propriété intellectuelle qui est euh, plus important pour les économies africaines. Les, les marques. Les marques. Mais, euh, monsieur Goury, euh, d'habitude, non, ministre, quand il vient, parce que je sais que le ministre sénégalais de la culture est venu vous voir, non, mais ça ne fait pas. Quand il vient vous voir, vous discutez de quoi Et qu'est-ce que vous le conseillez Bon, il n'est pas venu en fait. Euh, <rire> euh, on attendait ce matin, mais il y a eu euh, une difficulté. Je ne sais pas si ça a été rapporté encore. Oui, mais euh, c'est le ministre de la Culture, donc on va discuter, on va de, discuter des, des industries euh, créatives. Donc les, le, la musique, le cinéma, la danse, euh, la littérature, c'est surtout ça dont on va parler. Et euh, surtout l'amélioration du système de la euh, gestion collective des droits des auteurs. Tiens. Merci beaucoup. This is the number of patents for the applications filed, correct? But not the number that have been approved? Yeah. And That's right. So, what is the significance of this? I mean, is it possible then that, you know, there were a lot of crappy applications filed in China <laughs> or in, you know, or in the U.S. or anywhere? And I mean, qualitatively, 
is the sheer number of this really that significant? Yeah. It doesn't take into account the quality. No, I think it's a very, uh, very good question. Uh, we know that nearly a, pat a million patents were granted, okay, in 2011. So that's a, that is a very significant number uh, as well. Um, and the number of granted patents worldwide in 2011 grew by 9.7%. 9, 9 so, you know, there was a significant growth in grants as well. Uh, but as in everything, you know, an application for a patent, uh, not all of them are accepted first. Uh, they are evaluated against the criteria of patentability, whether they're sufficiently inventive, whether they're new or not. Uh, and uh, so that's one threshold to pass. And the other, on quantity, there is a lot of concern about quantity around the world, and it's a subject that's being studied closely, uh, quality rather, uh, a lot of um, attention being paid to quality around the world. So for a start, our chief economist is undertaking a research project on quality metrics, uh, and Carsten, you might like to say something about that. Um, yeah, um, and maybe just to start with this, I think the challenge is that innovation really is an intangible phenomenon, and as such, to measure it, you know, it is quite different. It's a quite different measure, measurement challenge compared to measuring trade flows that <coughs> cross border. Um, or to measure um, economic output uh, for which uh, firms themselves easily compile um, 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 data. Um, the advantage uh, with patent data is, you know, patents leave a trace whenever an inventor um, files a, a patent application at a national office. But obviously we know that there is no one-for-one -one correspondence between the number of patent applications that are filed uh, and their technological contribution or the economic value that these patents eventually generate. Uh, you know, as the Director General mentioned, um, you know, many patents um, um, you know, will never um, reach the ex end of the examination stage uh, because the applicant may not find it attractive anymore to pursue the patent. Other patents are worth, uh, other patents are found not to um, comply with the patentability <coughs> standards, uh, so uh, the office uh, rejects them. The challenge with looking at grant data, which some people have argued is a more meaningful um, metric, is that grant data um, refers to applications that have been filed in many different years. So if you look at the data we provide on patent grants, uh, these are patent grants for 2011, but the applications uh, underlying these grants uh, may um, uh, date from the late 1990s to um, you know, 10 years ago, um, who knows? Uh, so in terms of you know, sort of um, providing a direct uh, insight into you know, the level of innov innovative activity that's going on in a particular point in time, patent grant data is, is, is not that useful. But ultimately, our job with, or our intention with this report is to you know, simply publish uh, all the data that uh, um, is submitted to us and then it's available um, to the research community, to, to journalists, and you, know, you can draw your own conclusions from these data. So, so do you publish the grant on uh, data Yes, it's all in the it's report. All and if I may have just a couple of words on that. You know, what is a good quality patent uh, is, is uh, the question. You know, and is it a patent that has emerged from a process which was a good process and, you know, considered the appropriate databases and had an, a, proper, a proper level of person considering it? Is it a patent that is not overturned on appeal, you know? Is it a patent that generates a lot of money? Or is it a, a, a patent that makes a good social contribution? So, you might have uh, innovations in the field of soci social media that make millions if not billions uh, is that a better quality innovation than an innovation in the medical field which saves lives for a uh, disease which affects a population of only say 60 million people worldwide or 6 million people worldwide an orphan disease i think it's a very i'm not trying to be difficult i'm <laughs> giving you some of the considerations that i think go into trying to assess what is a quality innovation, and it's not an easy question. 
Oui, bien sûr. Pour euh, revenir sur cette, cette question des, des brevets qui n'arrivent pas, qui sont refusés, oui. est-ce qu'on a, on peut quand même donner un taux de déchets, entre guillemets, euh, est-ce que c'est 20%, 30% euh, Ça dépend du pays, ça dépend, ça dépend du pays. Du pays. Euh, par exemple, pour euh, la Chine. <rire> je ne sais pas, euh, je sais dire, pas ça ne sert à rien de déposer oui. 10 brevets s'il y en a qu'un qui, qui, qui sort. Euh, non, je ne pense pas que ce soit comme ça. Je pense que l'autre, c'est plutôt euh, aux alentours de 2 euh, tiers parce et un tiers euh, ah, est refusé. Ouais. Mais ça, c'est très, très bon, général. Bon. Mais pas pour la Chine, extrêmement général comme, comme mesure. Mais c'est dans ce, ce genre de figure. Oui. Euh, ça, c'est en ce qui se concerne la Chine Bon, en général, oui, en général, mais c'est très... Ouais, across the board, yeah. uh, Just one question concerning one abbreviation on the ranking third place in the trademarks. It's O-H-I-N. Which country yeah. is that? Europe. Sorry. Europe. Right. Europe. So it's... It's the EU or EU? EU. 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 Sorry. EU. So it's the European Community Mark. Uh, which OHIM is Office of Harmonization for the Internal Market. Uh, Dan and then Catherine. Uh, Francis mentioned that um, this, the backlog of patent applications mm. has been a concern for a number of years. It's easing slightly. You said it's due to policy um, developments. Mm -hmm. so what exactly are they doing then? Okay, so uh, first, uh, there is a consensus to use the PCT as the work sharing platform. So we are seeing more applications go through the PCT. This is one one measure, a strengthening of the PCT, which obviously is a uh, you know involves a certain amount of reduced duplication. The second measure is that the United States Patent and Trademark Office has had a very aggressive program to reduce its own backlog and it's reduced it to about 660,000 uh, applications now and it was much, much higher. And the third one is Japan has also made a very significant effort going down from about 1.8 million to about 1.2 million. Right, and if I can complement this, what happened in the case of Japan, and you know, um, uh, quantitatively, Japan uh, really uh, is the big, biggest contributor to the reduction in the global backlog, and that has to do with the fact that uh, overall filings have declined in Japan, and uh, if you wish, that has given the Japanese office uh, some breathing space, and they were able to, um, you know, make the resources available for examining the applications that were on the backlog. Uh, so quantitatively, uh, I don't have the figure here, it's somewhere in the report, but uh, Japan really accounts for most of the reduction in the global backlog. And that declined from 1.8 to 1.2 in the broad period? Uh, that's over a period from 2007 to 2011. One also sees a small reduction in the backlog at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and as the Director General mentioned, this is due to the resources uh, that uh, um, uh, that office has put into um, examining patents. Uh, however, one does observe an increase in the backlog uh, at uh, the European Patent Office. Um, mm -hmm. And on a reduced scale, Brazil and India are both committing much more resources to the processing of patent applications. Catherine, and then I believe it's soft. It's soft, okay. <laughs> Catherine. I just have a small question on the, the, the discussion at the uh, IPI for the moment on the committee of uh, industrial design yeah. and yeah. So uh, it seems that everybody is interested in, in getting an instrument to harmonize a uh, procedure, yeah. but there's a different stand. Like, some countries would like it to, to happen more quickly, and developing countries are not in such a hurry. And if I look at the numbers, I can see that apparently it works very well for developing countries and yeah. middle income countries for the moment. So, why uh, maybe that would explain why they're not in such a hurry to have an instrument right now? And look, I, the way I would interpret it is as follows, and, and uh, uh, naturally, I'm an optimist. Uh, I think that what we had from the assemblies, our uh, annual meeting in October, was a positive decision for this, which really said there will be a design law treaty, basically. And that having happened, that positive decision having uh, occurred, 
we now see a greater level of engagement in the committee this week. Uh, and therefore, I think we are seeing delegations arrive who have not really been party to the negotiations up to now, who are raising a lot of questions that they didn't raise earlier on because they weren't there. So I would interpret uh, this week as a greater level of engagement as we're coming to uh, the final stages of the negotiations. But more generally, you're right that um, you know this is a form of, of protection that is very favourable or accessible to developing countries, middle-income countries in particular. The statistics bear that out, and it's it's, a, uh, it's it's very good. And design protection, you know, is an important part of innovation more generally. If you take the iPhone, uh, the estimate uh, done on the iPhone with respect to the iPhone, which added billions to the value of uh, Apple, the estimates is that patented technology accounted for only 25% and the rest was designs and marketing uh, innovation. 20%? 25. Mm. Yeah. That was the OECD's estimate. Um. Sorry. Um. Gentlemen and gentlemen, whatever. Yeah, interesting, uh, Francis, you're giving us such detailed breakdown on the performance of the iPhone. Do you have similar data on what are the revenues generating from uh, licensing for uh, patent holders mm -hmm. and uh, franchising trademarks, whether it's... Uh, uh, no, short answer, uh, which is the same answer you received last year in the year before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, we are talking at the moment about how we can, you know, what we, we can do to... anecdotal stuff because this stuff is yeah. very dry. You yeah. don't bring in, how yeah. much does Philip make from their yeah. licensing of their, I don't know, digital yeah. technologies or something, otherwise it's, it's just too numbers difficult. that drive us mad. Mm. Well, we're, we're talking at the moment about how we can improve in particular the market data. Right. The, 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 the data on what's what the use of this exactly. is. Yeah. Right. And if I might ask, what is the, of these uh, patent applications and patents approved, how many are actually go to the production phase are in use? Mm. Because you know, in Australia, it's a great innovative country, but a lot of the stuff doesn't make it to the production. Yeah. I mean, if I can first maybe answer your question and then say something about licensing. Um, you know, that's definitely the case, but I don't think, you know, this uh, tells you much in a sense that we know that the innovation process is an uncertain process. Uh, patents are usually filed at a relatively early stage in the innovation process precisely because, you know, you want to make sure that you have your claim uh, on your invention. By the time you file a patent, in many cases, uh, you don't know yet whether um, that technology, you know, will develop in a way that uh, it, uh, you know, will have a um, market. Uh, and also, you don't know how the market develops. Uh, and, you know, that's maybe most striking in the pharmaceutical industry for where, you know, for um, um, many initially promising com compounds, you have only very few um, that make it uh, to um, the marketplace. And I think that just reflects uh, the innovation um, process. There's also evidence uh, that comes from surveys of inventors that has been done, you know, that literally shows that the distribution of patent values is highly skewed in the sense that, uh, you know, less than 10% of all patents account for, you know, more than 90% of all the value that is generated by the patents. Yet again, you know, that doesn't reflect that these other patents are useless. It just reflects, you know, to a large degree, the uncertainty of, of the R&D process. Uh, your question on licensing, the short answer is, you know, we don't collect any systemic uh, data on licensing. Largely because we don't know, um, you know, um, whom to ask, at least officially. There are no government agencies uh, at the national level who compile these data. Most of these licensing transactions are private uh, transactions. Uh, A lot that of this stuff is in uh, publicly listed companies and reports. Right. Right, and we have in the World Intellectual Property Report that was published last year provided some figures uh, on that. 
I should also say I was at a conference recently at the OECD in Paris where there were a few interesting studies on particular sectors that presented you know, some licensing related information, for example, for the pharmaceutical industry. And I think you know, more and more data, more and more evidence is becoming available. But I would say it's still sort of you know, pockets here and there. Yes, you can get something from the SCC filing doesn't yet give you sort of a good global idea of, you know, how important are licensing transactions, you know, relative to, um, you know, let's say as a share and of, the same of patents that are trademarks fine. and franchising. And it's, it's even more difficult in the case of, of, of trademarks and franchising, I would say. I mean, we're currently looking into because this. Because in these areas, if you look, uh, it's double digital growth in some of these companies franchising 60-70% growth in turnover. Right, right. So, um, and you make take We'd make these reports far more interesting for us. Right. Yeah. right. No, we've got the point. <coughs> and Again. so we're looking at yeah, at um, well, market data. I think is, and we'll have some next year. All right. At least. Okay. Hi. Uh, on PCT applications, on, on page sixty-five, there is a PCT company for us, and it's a China. It looks like Chinese company is right now. It's the first time the Chinese company ranked top this time also. No. It's not the first time. Okay. Uh, in the past, Huawei has ranked top. Okay. Uh, in other years, I think last year it was Japan, if right. I'm not mistaken, and, and the year before. And yeah. Okay. And the year before it was uh, China. I think. Right. Right. And maybe just to clarify, and not to confuse you, the PCT figures yes, are not new because yes. we already published them. I think in March of this year. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of uh, you know having. For the sake of comprehensiveness, all the figures are in you know, this, report. this report, which is really our flagship uh, statistics report. But that's also why we didn't put it in the press release, because these are not new figures. Okay. Okay. And then, Jim. Yeah. Uh, um, Japan is still uh, the main country of origin uh, of these patents, is that right? Uh, the patent file. Uh, what does it say about, uh, I don't know if there is any kind of relation? Right. Uh, if that's the case, it simply means if you look at patent <coughs> filings by origin, you count not only the filings of, in this case, um, Japanese residents in Japan, you also count the filings of Japanese residents uh, all around the world in other um, patent offices. And there we, for example, see that uh, you know, most of the patent filings of Chinese residents are in China. Um, um, so you know, the patent filings in China are still mostly domestically. Whereas, you know, for Japan, uh, for many European countries in the United States, uh, um, filing abroad is, is much more important. And that explains why China is not, maybe not yet, who knows, uh, on top uh, in the list of uh, patent filings by country of origin. I can try. Jean-Pierre. Jean -Pierre. Yes, um, I have uh, well, two basic questions. Um, one is the, if, 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 a, if a company wants to protect um, a patent worldwide, it has to make the application in each country. Yeah. And that, okay. And the second question, what is a utility model? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, a utility model is like a, a lesser patent. Okay, a lesser patent. Sometimes like called a, a petty patent. In some, <laughs> yes. A second wife. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sometimes called a petty patent. Uh, so it's it's a title that is granted typically for seven years, or uh, maybe between seven and ten years, rather than twenty, and without an examination. So uh, it's it's quite interesting to see. It has been quite extensively used historically by Germany, Japan, now China, and Korea. And it's quite interesting to see in those countries graphs, which might typically go, you know, here it was the starting point for the number of patent filings, and here's the number of utility model filings. And as technology, technology becomes more sophisticated, the patents go up and the utility models go down, and they intersect. And you can see that very clearly over 30 years for Japan. Well, so 40 years for Japan. Well, if you were, for example, inclined to follow uh, Hernando de Soto, you know, and his theory about property rights, then it is getting people used to property in intangibles, 
in one and getting them used to the whole property system uh, in intangibles. So that would be one. Another more simple explanation is that it caters to a lower level of technology. So you might have farm, uh, you know, agricultural I innovation at a less sophisticated level than nuclear physics or, you know, molecular biology covered by utility models, typically. A actually, historically, in Germany, they grew out of design protection. What, what happened in Germany is that there were such long delays in the 19th century in the grant of patents that people started filing industrial design applications to protect the inventions. And that mutated into the utility model.